Okay. Hello, friends. We're glad to have you back with us on Thriving in Juniata, uh, the webinar that we've been uh, recording and, uh, and putting out into the world for the families of our Juniatians uh, to sort of understand and be aware of how the semester unfolds and the supports and resources that exist, uh, that exist for our incoming students in particular, but uh, for all of our students. Uh, my name is Matthew Damshoulder. I'm your Dean of Students and Vice President for Student Life, and I have a loyal co-host here with me, the Avion. Uh, that's my that's my part. <laughs> to introduce yourself. Yeah, the Avion Clayton, second year engineering physics POE, secondary emphasis in math. That's new. I just mm -hmm. added that. That's yeah. right. Congratulations. So very excited. This is going to look very good. Who's mind. your advisor? Um, he's my general advisor. Uh, and uh, Dr. White is my POE advisor. Yeah, yeah. So, and we are excited. We have a special guest, President Troha. Yeah, good. Mr. President is here. I wish I could see everybody, but I can't. <laughs> so I'll just say hello. Right. We speak into the uh, into the nether world, but we will take chat questions. So if you're out there uh, in viewer world and would like to uh, send a question our way, please use the chat function. Uh, we love to interact as we can and uh, and answer your questions as well. Uh, but it was our pleasure and uh, and delight that you, when you said that you would join us and yeah. talk a little bit about your experience as president and uh, and as a parent of a college student and yeah. offer some advice to our soon to be two college community. students. I know, right? Next year. So you're in that journey again, and I know it was really yeah. interesting to me when, uh, uh, you know, you and, and Madison and uh, Jennifer were touring schools, and uh, yeah. and you would go kind of undercover uh, to to some other institutions and see what they were doing, and then text us. <laughs> I from would tell you, yes, we need to start this, or oh my gosh, uh, you won't believe what I just heard. We were starting to steal those best practices. Yes. So you know, when you kind of think about. You know your own first year in college you know going away to, yeah. to school you know what, what stands out in your in your memory yeah which was uh 2013 for me it was my freshman year here and <laughs> um so i'm in year seven and but i remember distinctly several things first and foremost would be uh primarily the people that uh, i met in that first year i traveled the country on what was sort of the welcome tour for the new president and it was from california to boston and everything in between. you know i thought you were asking him his first year as a college student not as president there's so many first oh years, you right? I, I, that's I, why i laughed when you said 2013. Uh, i'm sorry Go which ahead. one did you mean my I, first year here i i met your first year in college but really I thought, and so oh, now i'm curious oh my about gosh. the first presidential year no well my <laughs> I probably can't speak to much of my first year in college because much of it is probably unspeakable. And thank goodness, there's no social media records. Right? There, that's right. That's right. It didn't exist. The blessing of being my Okay, age. so I, I thought you were talking about my first year here. My first year in college? Well, I, I mean, the thing that I remember most about was um, I chose college for all the wrong reasons. And I, I think about that time I was dating a young woman and we chose the same school. And I also chose my school based on um, who had shown me the most love as a baseball player. And I went to college to play baseball. And uh, the academics was about number seven on the list of things right. that I really cared about at the time when I was 18 years old. Um, and who knew that would be the thing that ultimately I, mattered? That, that's, that's right. That's right. That's why I tell everybody the, the let the journey unfold. Don't, don't try to determine too early what successes you may or may not be experiencing because for me they came much later and i mean much later like junior year in college it like light bulbs went off for me but so I, I remember um having conflicts around just relationships i had conflicts around whether or not i wanted to continue to play baseball or not and then of course the conflicts that i'm sure you experience as a student which is just what do i want to do in life what do i you know the job that i want to have the the path that i want to take I was a. I thought I wanted to be at first a cop, and then I thought I wanted to get into the FBI, CIA, and look what I'm doing now. So right. life changes, and it changes quickly. I, I try to say to parents and students all the time: just absorb the experience that you're in, enjoy the journey. Don't waste time, and you can't just sit there and let it happen. But you got to enjoy the process that life kind of unfolds for you. And for me. 
it took me down a path of engagement at the college level. I started to get involved with my fraternity. I got involved as a peer counselor, got involved in all kinds of different student life activities, which then I got to meet administrators. And they're the ones who started to have me think about maybe you have a career in higher education. And that's generally what happened. So, um, and it's interesting because <laughs> we've had, you know, guests uh, with us talking about, you know, you, you are preparing for a, for a job. You're preparing for a career, and the skills are bigger That's correct. than that first yeah. job. You're preparing for a life of learning and and challenges, and you're gonna you're gonna think you're going one way, and life's gonna take you another way, or your interests and passions are gonna take you someplace different. So, um, the key is to just remain centered on that whole thing, and don't let one or two things sort of get you sidetracked, because that sidetrack may take you down a path that you never expect and that was the case for me well uh junior is the college that changed lives and you started yeah. to tell us a little bit about learning about the school and what what brought you here yeah. um <laughs> i'm not going to get into the whole search process of becoming a college president because that would probably take up most of our time it's <laughs> it's sort of like uh making sausage you, you sort of like the end result but you don't like, right. want to know what went into it that was kind of the the presidential search process I think how I found Juniata is that I knew of it as a school, and when they had announced they were seeking a president, um, I had read the profile. I was then contacted by, in effect, the headhunter, and it asked me to consider it. I read through it. It sounded like something that I could, um, you know, try to understand better. And uh, you know, one thing leads to another. You submit an application. They want to talk to you at an offsite interview. You do that. You come to campus, and they all ultimately select you. The thing that ultimately drew Jennifer and I here, and fortunately I had some other options to go to other places, but what we what we loved about here was the community and the people. Mm -hmm. Because when you take on the presidency or, or any job for that matter, you are embracing the culture, you're embracing the lifestyle of that place. And we had to really determine that this was a place that we could raise a family in and that we could be around for a long period of time. So for us, it came down to the culture of the place, the humanity that we met, the students, the faculty, the staff, the, the Huntington community, and we fell in love pretty quickly. And so, yeah. when when we got um, we got that offer, um, like I said, I fortunately I had some other choices, but it was a no brainer for us. Quite frankly, we said we want to go there. Yeah, and you're and you're on you're basically on campus, aren't you? Yeah, Every the president's day. house is about a mile <clears throat> from campus. I mean, we can almost see the campus from where the president's house sits. It's just um, up by the hospital. I think, so it, just, I think it's really down. helpful that you're literally a part of the community yeah. on a daily basis as opposed to just coming in for work and yeah. making all these decisions and then you're out of yeah. here. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I live here. My kids go to the local schools and I do grocery shopping here and yeah. I'm just part of, and, and uh, you know, part of what I love about what I do is just being on campus as much as um, as much as I can to see students in their element to go to the volleyball game tonight after this um, tomorrow we have several events on the calendar to go yep. to and um, Saturday we have an enrollment event so all those things um, I, I just love to be part and parcel of the whole experience. I think it's such a blessing that you're an engaged president that students know you that you know them I mean it just really I think changes the character of the educational experience when you feel like, you know, there's visibility of leadership. Yeah. And, and I think it changes the leadership when, you know, you're living with and close to, you know, the people who, whose educational experience you're shaping. I, I don't know if you can do this job, I would argue, because if you didn't want to do that, because um, you're, you're trying to make decisions what's in the best interest of the students typically, and how can you do that if you don't know the constituency that you're serving? And so uh, living among the students, being with the students, eating in the dining hall, going to the events, you get an understanding of, of how you're supposed to lead and who you're supposed to lead um, and toward what. So I don't, I, and, and, and listen, there are presidents who have different styles. Mine is just to try to be as visible and transparent uh, with, you know, not just students, but to everybody here, so I can do a better job of, of being being present. My right. first image of, of President Trump was on the quad. I forgot what like meet and greet it was. I think yeah. it was just like the beginning. Of yeah, maybe coffee, coffee on the quad, on the first quad. day of classes. Yeah, but last last year, my my first my first go round, and um, 
It was you, your wife, and your dogs. And it was, wow, I, love them. I, I immediately felt like my, my president was cool because he had his dogs on <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, those are such cool dogs. I love those dogs. Lainey and Lila. Yeah. yeah. I was very happy. <laughs> well, I mean, you've been around for seven years. What are some of the exciting changes that you've led or, or seen happen here on campus? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think Juniata over 140 years has done a, a terrific job of, and I'm only the 12th person to have, to be in the office in 140 years. And when you think about that, it's pretty remarkable that we've had that stable of leadership. And what I was going to say is that I think while we have to continue to adapt and evolve as an institution in terms of how our institution speaks to a more contemporary learner, there's parts of Juniata that has not changed, have not changed, and will not change. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that is the culture of this place. There is a, uh, what I often characterize as an authenticity of the place that is so true. And when you talk to alums, as I do, who graduated 15, 16 years ago, they speak of that same authenticity. They speak of having the kinds of relationships with faculty and staff as we do now. And so while we continue to evolve our campus changes physically, new buildings, renovated buildings, new programs, uh, new faculty and staff, there's, there's, there's an element of the Juniata, um, um, the institution that remains the same. And I think that's pretty special. I think, and I, I think I have an obligation to try and maintain that and make sure that we don't lose the soul of who we are, even though we might offer graduate programs, which mm -hmm. we didn't do five years ago or we open up a new building or we add new faculty and staff, there's an element there that I think is incumbent upon all of us to protect, whether it's students leaving their backpacks in the, in the lobby of Ellis Hall, which has been a tradition for a long time, and there's an element of trust and respect there as a community. I find that to be really compelling, and mm -hmm. I, I find that to be a special uh, part of who we are. It's such a foreign concept to me. I'm from New York. <laughs> yeah. I don't leave my bag anywhere. <laughs> yeah, there's people who come from a more urban center. And they, they're they like, wait a minute, what? I was so yeah. confused. I, I walked. It was also last year, my first year here. And I walked in, and I'm going to eat. And I see people putting their bags down. I thought they were going to the bathroom. And then I looked around. There were so many of them. <laughs> the bathrooms aren't that big. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> what, why are you putting your bag down? Are, are you not allowed to bring it in? I had to ask somebody, like, do I have to leave my bag here? They're like, no, no, just don't want to carry it in there. I'm like, oh. And in my time, we have never had an incident of theft or somebody just something disappearing. Uh, it's 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 a remarkable testament to the community. That it is kind of interesting because we have like one camera in that lobby, and the only time we use it is when somebody misplaced. They forget where they put their bag. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we did have that. One. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, well, what what of your camp, you know campus events, lifelong learning, engaging in this space? What what are some of your favorite things to do outside of be the president? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, if this is about sort of thinking about all the events I go to in any given year, I, I would rate the Bailey Oratorical as mm. probably one of my favorite, if not at the top. I don't know what that is. Okay, so what? the, the Baileys? What? You're not, I don't know what that is. Okay, so you're in year two, you need to come. That's right. At, in February, it's usually toward the end of February. Okay. The Bailey Oratorical, it's our oldest tradition here at Juniata. I think it'll be 109, Something 110 like this yeah. year. Yeah. And it is a competition, a speaking competition for Juniata students who are given a prompt, okay? You can you compete on a Saturday to earn one of the final seven slots, okay? So every year there's usually about 40 students yeah. who compete, okay? The faculty, there's a group that listens to all those speeches. They're what, seven or eight minutes in length. Yeah. No more than like you eight get minutes. Cut off, red light. And you compete for one of the seven slots and then on the, on the Bailey is usually on a Tuesday night, I think, is, um, is it happens it's about an hour and a half program and they deliver their speech and then they get um evaluated and assessed and there's a bailey oratorical winner um there's a panel of judges yeah but they're given a prompt on something that's facing our world today so it might be about how might you um um address the diversity inclusion issues that our country is facing today for example 
Um, they did one when I was hired, but not yet here. So it was like February of 2013 before I arrived. It was, what advice do you have um, for, for President Troja? Yeah. And that was fascinating. I was in Ohio and I was watching it online and I was so impressed by our students and what they had to share about what was important to them. And that has remained with me, but not just that one, but every year I am so impressed by the students who perform the Baileys. It and is a blast. And they're online. If you, yes, search you can them watch YouTube, the Baileys. You can go back and see past years. Um, yes. We will post, look on our website. There will be um, information about how to connect, but it's on YouTube and you can go back to previous Baileys and watch. Our students do a phenomenal job. It's about time for the prompt to come out. Actually, I think students it comes, start, uh, start preparing. Does it come toward the end of the semester? Yeah. Okay. It sounds like something that you that might would come from the heart at all times. Oh, me? <laughs> Don't put me on the spot, Prez. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the Bailey would be probably the one that I get most excited about. And um, I mean, any of our traditions, whether it's Mountain Day or storming or Madrigal is coming up, it's right around the corner of the tenting. Um, did you tent last year? No, I did not. You haven't tented yet? <laughs> I don't do tents. <laughs> I don't. I see my issue, and oddly enough, I still chose this school. I I'm not that big of a nature person. So when we came for orientation and we had to make the yeah, walk right, up, up, the, up to the Peace Chapel, Chapel. Peace Chapel, I was miserable. It's like, I'm sorry, where's the escalator? <laughs> yes. Is there, yes. Is there an escalator? I was hot and there was like bugs that I've never seen before. Uh, I'm a city kid. All I know is concrete and skyscrapers. That's all I know. So that's why this experience is so compelling for you. Uh, this is something different. Than when you. I arrived, I was promised I would see a bear, and I am still waiting. Mm -hmm. I, I, if the day is coming. Trace, Tracy Gryeski, yeah. she she moved to her new house, and she Within has like days. She saw did bears did in she, her yeah. yard. Yeah, it was a mother bear and her cubs. And the field station people observed the yeah. same, okay. the same mother bear. And oh, cubs. A lot of bears. My, I'm waiting for my Pennsylvania bear. Well, I, you know, as a parent of a college student, yeah. you know, what, what observations do you have about that? You know, first year, second year, now third year. I know. So my daughter is a junior this year, and um, there are some things that I just don't want to know about if I got my college student. Mm -hmm. She shares as much as she wants to share, and I honestly, I don't ask um, a lot of questions. Um, because I, I think the important thing about this space, not just me having a daughter where I'm president, but I think any parent, it's important for them to be able to feel they've, they are experiencing a level of independence mm -hmm. and a little separation from mom and dad. And I think that's hard for parents today, you know, with, with texting and just having access to, um, to phones as much as we do today, it's easy to stay connected. And, um, I, I think it's important to have a little disconnect and cut that umbilical cord uh, a little bit and to allow um, them to feel like they're they're away and making decisions on their own. Um, I don't know how it's been for you, but um, my my one daughter that, that has gone away, I think helped. I think the first year she kept on wanting to communicate with us. And as time has gone on, she's starting to make much more many more decisions on her own which you know she's starting to to kind of grasp this concept of sort of separation that's hard for a parent because you you know for 18 years you had them under your roof but um so that i would say that's been hard for both her and for us to separate but that's i think all parents is just part of the natural process I mean, the other thing would be just around you want to be there um for them when they need you but not too much yeah. you, you want to Make sure you offer them the support, but also give them, you know, I'm not going to answer that for you. I've, she's texting me about what should I do. I'm like, that's your call. And so I think some boundaries, let me relate to that independence, but those boundaries are important. Yeah, I, I just uh, I just have, you know, I, I think it is so hard to sort of know what's right. And every student is a little bit different. And, you know, the... The uh, relationships that we're building with parents, I think, are so important because we have to be able to take, you know, students' concerns seriously and address them and help provide them with supports and resources. And so allowing parents to channel their students towards the people here who are doing that work, I think, is I think really I think um, I, I wrote my dissertation on this topic. It was around sort of the level of parental engagement and what's best for your student. And so very quickly... 
you don't want to be too detached. You don't want to completely let them go off on their own. You also don't want to be that helicopter parent of hovering over your kid with everything. There is, like in life, there is sort of a middle ground um, about parenting a college student that is best for your student. They need to know that you're there. You're, that you're going to be there for both the ups and the downs. But it's also helpful to provide a little bit of distance. Uh, but if you're there too much, um, they don't do well either because they can't then make decisions on their own. So there's that kind of middle middle ground that's really important for parents. It was, it was for me, my mom, and when I think about it now, I really, I really appreciate it more. Like the 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 further along you go, the more you you notice and appreciate the things that your parents did. My mom, throughout high school, started to give me more ground. You know, the older I got, and she she learned that she had to let go a little bit more just because I need to be my own person yeah. and learn what's wrong and what's right. And um, just me personally, I always, I liked the independence of trying to do things on my own. I'm kind of bullheaded sometimes where like, I always need to know why. So if, if I want to do something and, and she says that I, I shouldn't, I want to know yeah. why, like, yeah. why shouldn't I? I'll listen to you, but can you please tell me why? Right. And like, she hated that I would argue with her. And um, it's just, she let me be who I who I wanted to be. And um, she knew that if I needed her, I'll ask her. And she was always gonna be there when I asked. Yeah. So um, now being in school, she um, she calls to check in cause you know, she misses her, her child as she should. Um, and I call her just to say hi when, when I miss her because there's some <laughs> days where you want to be home and, and be with your mom or, and your dad. But um, I I usually, when I need her, she'll be there and I'll yeah. call her. Yeah. She'll check in from time to time, but she lets me go on. And if she she knows that if there's something wrong, I'll let her know. Yeah, that's perfect. That's good. Well, um, you know, one of your big tasks as president is to bring money into the institution. And, you know, I tell students and uh, and families that, you know, the tuition dollars, the sort of, you know, money that students bring to the institution are so important. And we know that that's a huge commitment and trust on the part of students, but one in every $4 that supports the operations of our campus comes from a donor, an alumni, okay. a friend, you know, a, a source of philanthropy. And uh, our belief campaign is really about building financial support for the, the college and its future. And yeah. I, I believe we just raised, uh, move past the hundred million dollar mark, yes. which is so exciting yeah, to yeah. sort of see that kind of progress. And it means, you know, we'll have some opportunity to change campus in constructive yeah. ways. What what are some of the changes that students will see in their four years here yeah. if they were new this fall? Well, I mean there there are there are immediate things that the belief campaign is going to support and then probably more importantly and, and this is, you know, no offense, but well, I mean, as an alum, you'll appreciate this. A lot of the changes that are going to come from the campaign are going to be post many of the students that are here right now. Mm -hmm. But as an alum, you'll be proud to know that we are reinvesting in facilities. We're trying to build the endowment so Junia can be here for another 140 years. So there's three buckets of money that we are raising. Um, number one would be to support affordability. Mm -hmm. We know that uh, college affordability and the pressure this brings on our students and our families is 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 chore number one. When they choose us, how do I pay for this experience is at the top of the list. We have to continue to do as strong of a job as possible to provide more resources to support scholarship funding. So the more you can raise and build your endowment, it allows us to spend more out of that endowment to student scholarships to make the whole experience more affordable. That's number one. Number two would be you're coming here to get an education. So bucket two would be to support the faculty that deliver that experience. So we call that building faculty strength, trying to support them in their professional development, try to retain the very best faculty that we already have, trying to attract even better faculty, right? Um, providing um, professorships and chairs so they are provided um, above their compensation resources they're provided other resources they can do undergraduate research they can buy equipment for their labs all those sorts of things and then the third leg of the stool or the third bucket that we're raising for is around capital improvements we know how important facilities are to students and parents 
you want to study in contemporary spaces. You want to be able to um, enjoy yourself, whether it's playing an intramural soccer game or if you're on um, the tennis team or a uh, soccer team that you want facilities to play in that you can be proud of. That costs money. And so we're raising money to help reinvest. So on that front, our, our next project, and this is unfortunately, I think you'll probably be graduated by the time it's done, but we're going to be completely reconstructing, reimagining our library space. Yeah. Uh, Bigley Library is going to be undergoing a, about a uh, 11 to 12 million dollar renovation addition. So every floor is going to be renovated. We're going to add on a lounge slash cafe that you can get a sandwich and coffee and sit and study. And um, we're still talking about the hours of that, whether or not it will be a 24 hour space or something. But um, our library needs some love. Yeah, um, could have had a job opportunity I had. <laughs> <laughs> so that the campaign is delivering among those three areas, I think going to be a lot of needed resources, both now and in the present. I mean, we've raised $100 million, so you are experiencing some of that. Winton Hill was part of, so our new soccer, lacrosse, tennis complex, that came out of the campaign. Students are experiencing that now. Keppel Hall, our new IMA building, that was built um, during this campaign time. Nathan, the, too. Nathan Hall was done just prior to the campaign, but that's a good example of a facility that we knew students needed. They wanted more single rooms and more flexible space. So uh, we hope to continue that with this campaign. Yeah. So it, the goal, the revised goal, it went from 100 million to $115 million. It, the campaign will end um, basically two years from this fall. So we've got roughly a year and a half to um, to finish raising the money to, to cross that 115 mark. And I think uh, we'll, we'll, we'll exceed that 115 goal, I think. That's awesome. Yeah, that's, that's good work. Exciting. Well, everybody. thank you so much for taking time to spend with us and uh, and talk with our families. And, yes. Uh, <laughs> Good to be with y'all. And so we'll release you to go uh, cheer in, on the volleyball team. I'm in a volleyball game. Let's, Let's get a slot. win. Let's get a win. What time did you start? It started at 7. Yeah. It so will be over in a bit. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> thank you. Have a good one. Uh, and we'll invite in our next guest, the Tina. Thanks, I sacrificed to be on this show with you. I know. I know. I know. We'll uh, we'll invite our next guests in, and uh, and welcome uh, health and wellness to the table. I feel like there should be music, Ooh. transitional music, <laughs> right? What would be your uh, play on song? Isn't that when baseball players come up, they like walk um, on and yeah. to a song? They yeah, they choose. Mine one. would be scream and shout because it would just be excellent. Yes. Um, you got to switch this way, Tina. You're one, off camera. Whichever the pitcher <laughs> for Boston was the closer. Yeah, I can't remember his name. Oh, no. I don't know. That That's either. probably. That's probably that's probably we should know. <laughs> we should have probably coordinated that uh, intro a little bit more thoroughly beforehand. But uh, we're, we're glad to invite you uh, back to the table, Jonathan, and to our conversation, Tina. Uh, you'll remember Jonathan from, I think, episode two or maybe three. Who was yes. um, Who is our lead counselor in uh, the Health and, uh, or the Glazer Counseling Center on campus. And Tina Broughton, Broughton is our college nurse. Uh, and not new to Juniata, but new, newer in the full-time yeah. role of college nurse. And we're right. just so blessed to have you because I think you bring sort of a an ethic of care and a warmth to our students that is just unmatched oh, and so you. it's it's been delightful to hear students say oh i i was feeling sick and i went to the <laughs> health services and i got some tlc and also some robitussin and <laughs> some oh, tlc and robitussin <laughs> in appropriate quantities naturally i don't think you could be in the health and care field and not care really yeah. I, I, <laughs> I, I don't know i'm thinking in the past business. um well you we'll should. put a pin in that we'll put a pin in that <laughs> Oh, uh, well, it, you know, nice so we're approaching Thanksgiving. Uh, mm -hmm. We we are getting under freezing some overnights. <laughs> People are inside a little bit more and a little bit longer. Darkness comes at five fifteen or five thirty. <laughs> it ridiculous. is the season uh, when we need to pay special and particular attention to health and wellness, and just being mindful that uh, this season brings some joy. And also some distress mm -hmm. uh, and your roles with mental health and with physical health really contribute I think to helping students keep uh, keep on track mm -hmm. to meeting their goals what are some of the pitfalls that you see or traps maybe you know that you see students occasionally fall into 
um, that make them a little more vulnerable um, to downtime or, or periods of, uh, of distress. I would say first and foremost, probably a lack of sleep. Yeah. I mean, sleep is in short order. Uh, for sure. <laughs> I thought you used to say that I'm sitting on a stack of monster drinks right now. <laughs> sleep and hydration. That was going to be my next thing is hydration. Um, they just keep burning at both ends. So NPR just actually had a piece on uh, in the morning about, you know, the fact that the more sleep you have, the more regular your sleep, the better brain function is the more actual energy you have, the more productive you are. It's this paradox that mm -hmm. if I'm sleeping less, I'm doing more. When in reality, if you're sleeping appropriately, you're actually probably gaining inefficiencies around, um, you know, kind of meeting your goals. Right. How do we help students kind of understand that? Is that common knowledge, Davion? More sleep means more efficiency? Yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm thinking about it as you say. It. I mean, like, do I want to be more efficient or have more time? It's kind of like you need the middle ground. I don't know. You want both. I I love my <laughs> sleep. I really do, and um, I usually carve out the time when I need it. I'll make more time during my day to do the things that I need to, as opposed to take away sleep. Yeah. So I think I've got a good um, ethic going right now. That's good. I hope. I haven't needed to see either one of you yet. Oh, well. you're welcome anytime. <laughs> I'll probably uh, it'll probably be for a hug before it's for an actual reason to see you guys. Oh. I'm well, a I hugger. Get those too. That's okay. I'm a hugger. Who's who's the who's the lady at the front desk? Betty McCann. Betty. Betty. Yeah, I gave her oh, a hug. Also a treasure. Yeah. Jonathan, what about mental health? Are there things that students sort of pitfalls that, that students encounter? Or... Seasonal depression, a thing? Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, I think. I don't understand how it works. Well, the, a couple of complex questions. So uh, <laughs> I'll start with the <laughs> seasonal depression. Webinar. <laughs> the, um, we do have a happy light in the counseling center um, that addresses that, that need for um, healthy lighting. Um, we don't necessarily get that just by being in a lit area. Um, cloud cover, lack of sunlight, um, these contribute to, um, you know, a depressed mood for some people more so than others. Um, <clears throat> I'm one of them, but, um, you know, I think finding ways to um, break routines if you find yourself feeling down is important. Uh, but it's also, this is a part of the semester that's really challenging because, not necessarily because there's an in increased amount of work, although deadlines are starting to come into play. Um, but I think a lot of students try and sprint all the way through a semester. Mm. And you know, you hit week five, hit week six, and it's not like a familiar workload in college as it, as it was be when you're in you know, prior, to, prior to college. You might um, have been able to do that more effectively, and um, it's more about running a marathon and balancing that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, after several weeks of not sleeping, burning the candle at both ends, things start to maybe you lose motivation. You, you don't feel as good. You're not eating as well. Um, and then that kind of somewhat of a vicious cycle because if you lose motivation to do your work. Mm -hmm. You don't do the work because you're trying to get stress relief um, or you're trying to have some fun or socialize. And... Uh, and then you're falling behind because you're not doing the work and then you feel like you've got to catch up and you don't have you don't have a gas in the tank. This sounds like my month exactly <laughs> like to the word. Well I, I just had to I mean I was actually talking to a student today and it, you know, to your point, Jonathan, you know, he was like, Well, I I have been feeling like there's more on my plate and so actually I I stopped going to the gym because I wanted to make better use of that hour. And then you know, I've, I've also felt, you know, a little down. And so I've actually been eating a little more and a little differently <laughs> than I have been because I want those comfort foods. And all of this stuff contributes, you know, kind of to a cycle of me not feeling as good as I did a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we had to do some recognition together that, oh, what can we do to recapture some of that early semester magic? <laughs> well, it's interesting you say that because the first things to go are the things that are, are most needed. 
you know, okay, I'm, I'm behind, I'll sleep less. You know, I'll, I won't exercise, um, you know, and, and maybe that time is spent studying more, maybe not. Mm -hmm. um, but those resources that have been keeping, you know, positive mood, you know, good, um, good feeling for the most of the semester, they're the first things you get sacrificed in the, in the effort to create more time. Um, and uh, I think part of part of growing in college is just experiencing that and, and learning from it and um, adapting. You know, um, it, it took me until my senior year to really get a hold of, and that was longer than it, it, it needed to be. I'm not, no one to scare anybody. Um, but you know, in terms of recognizing, okay, I can't hit the ground running and have like a ninety percent in all my classes. And then week five, I don't have the energy to give. And it's mm -hmm. like, okay. So, um, you know, relaxation and, and recovery is non-negotiable. You know, and I think some students get to this point of the semester and they want to keep pushing and um, our bodies, our minds don't allow it. They demand, they demand the resources of time and rest. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's challenging. That's challenging. Well, Tina, I just... Went to CVS and I got my flu shot. Mm -hmm. okay. Is that good advice? <laughs> That's great. Yes. Do we do flu yes. shot clinic on campus? And we what, did. what if students failed to pay attention to that? Um, we are still giving flu shots in the clinic. You can come in um, during normal clinic hours. They can walk right in, and I will make sure they get their flu shot. Are there? Is there a cost for that? It is. It's um twenty dollars. We can either bill a student account or you can pay cash in the office. Okay. Big so, needle. Yeah. It is not a big no. needle. It's a little baby needle. I mean, what are the, the big <laughs> yeah. needles with the with the finger <laughs> holes for? What are those usually for? The what holes? What it's like, that's at the dentist. Because, <laughs> oh. like, you hold it with these two and you push in. I think that's at the dentist. Pull. For yeah. me, that's at the That dentist. was, um, I have a really big stainless steel looking one, like oh. you're talking about. But it's for flushing ears. It's not a big deal. Oh. Nothing that Which is actually not an uncommon procedure here at Junior. Oh no, we do that quite a bit. What are some other? Years. What are some? I mean, obviously, Robitussin and Tylenol. Yeah. You know, sniffles, sneezes, coughs, and wheezes. Yeah, well, so. You know, those kinds of concerns. What What other sorts of services does the health service provide that maybe parents or students are just now learning about? Um, we do a little bit of everything. Um, there's never a dull moment. It's certainly any acute. Um, illness or problem that the student would have, but also um, routine gynecological care. Um, we do um, OMT, which is an osteopathic manipulation treatment, which um, helps quite a bit when you have sore muscles or you have pulled something and it's pretty refreshing. Students really like it. And that's every other Friday morning. Um, boy, it just never ends. Um, Your problem solvers. Yes, you really exactly. You address and what comes through the door. That's it. And we never know what's coming through the door. We just take it as it goes. And we do have the physicians there three days a week. So that helps quite a bit. Yeah. You know, and they're flexible hours. You know, at, at times, you know, students need acute care. Or they need, you know, their family doctor. And, right. uh, and we'll be in touch, you know, with families or with students who are off campus uh, and returning. And you know, one of the pieces of advice that I always give families is to reach out and let, you know, the health service know mm -hmm. what's happened and what the care plan is right. to come back to campus. Can you talk about right. a little bit about how you follow up with students or provide continuity of care? Well, um, first and foremost, um, let us know. I mean, if there's a major illness or a problem that's happened during break um, or just off hours, we'd like to know, we'd like to make it part of your student's record so that we can um, have physicians on board. If we do treat them later, we know what's going on, we know a history. Um, part of that is returning health forms. Hopefully everybody mm. will think Still about a few that. delinquents. Yeah, there's a forms. few strays. <laughs> and vaccination records, because it's very important that we vaccinate, um, especially when the they're living in close quarters and they're at risk for a lot of different things that didn't really seem to be an issue when they were younger. So, you know, meningitis, we want to make sure that they get up to date on their Tdap, which is a tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis, which is the whooping cough. Mm. That's new guidelines. 
Um, but the health forms, it's real important that we know what's going on and then we can maybe refer to specialists. We try to really reach out and keep their care going here mm -hmm. when they're at school. So, so two questions for you. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a link for a Juniata or parent durable power of attorney and or a healthcare proxy form? No, that actually came up. Um, to my knowledge, we don't have a link. I do have where if the student is in for a visit, they can sign if they would like us to release information about that specific visit, but there's no blanket form that would cover everything. So when they come in, if they would like me to talk to mom or dad or whoever they um, designate, they can sign the paper that day and we'll only talk about that visit. Yeah, and I think we're happy yeah. to do that. And mm -hmm. students a of lot course. of times are learning how to navigate a world where you know their information is their own and they have HIPAA protections mm -hmm. in a new way and so some of the educational journey for them mm -hmm. is sort of realizing what those rights and responsibilities are even as they want to pull in family members who are a critical right. part of decision making. Right and it's difficult on the other end. I've been on the mom end, you know the parent end and it is difficult having a child who's now 18 at that magical age and up and then yeah. you don't have near as much control even when your child wants you to help you really it's a barrier it is but they're put in place for you know good yeah. reason so flu shot clinic would be the other question and we did have a flu shot clinic yes for we students. did we did have a flu shot clinic for two days and but we're still giving flu shots we still have them at the health center so students can walk right in and get their flu shot that's awesome mm -hmm. well jonathan you know one of the things and, and you know mental health is a daily practice it's sort of you know being aware is kind of something that we cultivate in students but college is also a time when students may encounter mental health challenges that they didn't know about or didn't know that or a part of their experience, you know, now and or going forward. And the Glazer Counseling Center, I think, can help provide some resources and supports for maybe families who are noticing changes in their student that are concerning, or, you know, for students who are self-reporting to families that, you know, it seems a little different for me right now. Can you talk a little bit about college as a time when mental health emerges for students as, uh, as an I think self-awareness. Sure. The um, I think one of the things that's important is that, as Tina had mentioned, with like HIPAA guidelines, um, that doesn't mean that we exclude um, or are aimed to excluding people from uh, a student's care. Um, it really is about you know empowering them, but at the same time encouraging them to utilize the resources. You know, connecting with family members, connecting with friends, um, you know, faculty, staff. Um, you know, and encouraging that that outreach on their part. Um, uh, you know, college is <clears throat> you know one of the first big steps into adulthood for a lot of a lot of our students, and and so that that you know there's unfamiliar challenges, um, whether that is being far away from home, whether it's um, you know sharing a space with another person, um, you know, kind of being more responsible for your your own daily schedule, your meals. Um, you know, um, developing new friendships, developing new relationships, um, developing new hobbies, interests. Um, you know, all these kinds of things I think collectively are, I feel, fall under the umbrella of new stress. Um, and stress isn't a particularly bad thing. It's just, um, you know, it can create challenges. And we're, I think, um, typically from a mental health perspective, um, you know, an onset of some illnesses. Um, most illnesses occur between the ages of 16 and 25. Um, and so that may be something that kind of flies under the radar or is managed pretty well environmentally um, in, a, in a stable home with a lot of supports. And then when there's a step into a bit more independence and autonomy, um, those challenges are um, not readily met or maybe not even readily understood. Um, and um, so if, if, if you're a family member um, and you're communicating with your student or a friend and you notice something that just seems to be a departure, it could be just that they're developing into the, their own. Um, and it, it may not be. So, um, you know, be honest and forthcoming with them. Um, if you have a special concern and they're 
not seem to be receptive to what you have to say because I don't know many 18 year olds that want to be following <laughs> the rules and listening to direction as much as they used to. That's part of that freedom is the excitement of, uh, of stepping into the adulthood journey. Um, reach out to us. We might not be able to share information readily, but we can certainly, um, you know, reach out to the campus um, resources. Um, we can certainly communicate different things. Uh, maybe not, uh, a counselor may not be able to, but um, the Dean of Students Office certainly can. Um, if, you know, it, it's not, it's not a bad idea to get the information of um, the, you know, the roommates and maybe some friends if they're willing to share those things. Um, contact information that way. Because, you know, the person that they spend every day with is the person that has the most insight now. And for a lot of families, that's, that's no longer you. And that's, I'm sure that's, that's a struggle as well. I, I can only imagine. So, 17 um, years, Jonathan, 17 years. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be there. So, um, yeah, and, and that, yeah, I'm, I'm a new father. Um, <laughs> she, to a beautiful she's, girl. Oh, she's turning one friend. on the 17th of this month. So, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's been fantastic. And um, when I came back to work, I was like, oh, my God. And I thought, well, when she goes to college, oh, my God. So, um, you know, and that. Kind of having that honest dialogue is is challenging because um, you know we want our students to thrive, we want them to develop that independence, and you know I think I heard Matthew speaking a bit earlier, and, and Gabby and I think we were talking about this. But, you know we want to be supportive, but we don't want to you know remove any any challenges. I mean that's part of the reason that's that's touched on the growth. Yeah. Um, and so you know that how do we keep our students in that sweet spot of challenging, not overwhelming. Um, but also not not easy. Um, you know, I mean, if if someone 4.0s the entire time at Juniata, they're either exceptionally gifted and kudos to them, or maybe we didn't challenge them enough. But they missed an opportunity. Yeah, we talked actually in our uh, first year foundations class this week about failure and risk taking. And, you know, the fact that resilience is built through overcoming obstacles. And if you never sort of, you know, stretch your muscles in a way that's unfamiliar, you don't grow those muscles. And likewise, in your life experiences, if you don't stretch yourself in a way that feels uncomfortable, you're doing yourself a disservice because you're leaving this place less pumped up then you you should be, then the opportunity prevails for you. And so, you know, to your point, I think helping students find those little ways that they can be challenged, maybe fall short, maybe find a way forward, um, I think can be really instructional uh, and, and are a part of our educational outcomes. And I want to touch real quickly on something else, which is that there's no problem too big or small to have somebody come in and say, hey, I just want to sit down and talk with somebody and check in on this. Um, one, one of the best interventions I've had in the past year um, involved somebody and they were, they were experiencing anxiety um, about a date. And I said, this isn't clinical. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, you know, it was kind of normalizing and relieving to know that, you know, sometimes things are distressing and that's appropriate. Um, we're not in the business of catastrophizing or, you know, responding with alarm. Um, at the drop of a hat, but you know we certainly know how to recognize you know greater need as well, and um, you know that's that's part of the service we provide on campus. We want to be able to reach any student that needs any kind of help that we can provide. Good luck. bless you. I, I th Thank I you. Think we have a great team that does that. Yeah, I, I do too. I think for me, as um, personally as a like young black man, I was taught very young like a lot of things are just supposed. I'm just supposed to absorb and like just like be a man about it and just like get over it. And uh, for the most part, it's become who I am, but there's some, sometimes I, um, like I can't see things beyond the surface of what's bothering me until it becomes too late. Um, just the other day, I would, um, you were talking about all the, the signs of seasonal depression and I, I didn't think I had that at all. I love the winter usually because I prefer to be cold and I prefer to be hot. Um, and I'm sitting in my room the other day and I thought 
I think I should go outside. And mm. never in my life have, like, I hear people talking about, um, like, taking walks and, like, enjoying a walk. I was like, oh, I'm not leaving my room to take a walk. Why would I do that? No. Is there an escalator? I'm, I'm, very, I'm very comfortable where I am. I'm, I walk. It sounded so dumb to me. And then the, like, the other day, I'm sitting there. And I'm like, I really, I didn't know what my thoughts were telling me. And I thought, do I want to go outside and like, get some air or something? And I, I felt it sounded an alarm in my head because mm. it wasn't like me to want to go outside at all. Anyone who knows me knows I prefer to be inside than outside. So I thought something was wrong. And a lot that often that's my pattern where um, if things will slowly happen and I don't notice it at all, I just think it's just, you know, the ebbs and flows of a day or mm -hmm. a week or a month. And then all of a sudden, like I notice like I'm in a place where I don't want to be and now I need to climb out and I may not be um, like really upset or depressed or I may be stressed out, but I never know what it is. I still can't put a name to any of it. And I don't have, when it's happening, I don't realize that I should be talking to somebody because it never seems like a, a time in which I need to release. So I'm confused as to when I get to that place, what went wrong. And I, I think that's just one of my flaws as to um, just being who I am, because I'm not sure of how I can fix that until you know, I get to that point and then I talk to somebody. Did you I, go outside? Mm, yes, I did. <laughs> I did. I wasn't hungry. I just put on my coat and I started walking. You were hungry for light. No, it wasn't even sunny. It was like a gray fresh air, day. Fresh air. Well, that, I mean, that, that is like, and I certainly will, you know, defer to your comments as well, but I had a professor, thank you, Dr. Gardner, who, you know, in our class would remind us we live in human bodies and we need to listen to them. Mm -hmm. And structures of schooling are grounded in controlling and constraining our bodies and saying no to our natural human needs and impulses. You can wait until recess to go potty, sit quietly <laughs> in your desk until you are dismissed. I'm sorry you were hungry. Lunch is in 35 minutes for a reason. Nobody can explain. It is all about external controls. And those are the systems of schooling that students are coming to us from. And part of this space is learning that you have some freedom and flexibility. And it's interesting to me in class when students will say, can I go to the bathroom? And I'm like, well, you've been going to the bathroom for 18 years at least. <laughs> I believe you can <laughs> and you should right like i i'm not going to tell you not to go to the bathroom you know and so it's about like owning your ability to make those observations and choices and hear your body and follow its directives and a lot of times if people would just listen to themselves it would be a lot healthier and i think to answer your question one of the best markers of, or indications of going to seek support is if you start asking yourself should i because that question won't occur to you unless there's something that is in need um, that doesn't mean when you seek out help that you can't solve the problem on your own um, but i'm a big believer in if someone else has already figured out a way to solve a problem that i have i should ask them what they did and if maybe it'll help me with that shortcut Unless that problem is finding directions from one place to another place, and then as a man, I need to do it on my own. I'm never lost. I'm always exploring. <laughs> oh, that was some gender humor. Um, one of our parents, Marsha, asks, why is there a charge for flu shots? Uh, isn't it covered under the student's health insurance plans? Uh, and our, our answer is it, it is actually covered for a lot of students under their health insurance plan if they go to CVS. Right. Or if they go to Rite Aid, uh, both of which are in town, Walmart, we'll go flu shots here in town. Um, but we don't, as a health uh, provider, accept insurance. Right. You know, we cover sort of some basic services, and we aren't able to include flu shots within that. Um, so uh, that is why we charge. And it's not a revenue-producing 
um, experience for us, we were just covering costs <laughs> yeah. in providing flu shots. And then the other half, my student gave the health center a comprehensive HIPAA form covering all appointments from his home doctor's office. Is that not honored at Judy Anna? And so it sounds like, no, we would need to no, use our own release. I think it's um, statewide, is to my understanding, um, that it's per Pennsylvania law that each time there's not like one um, consent, I guess it would be. We don't have a release for life option no. in Pennsylvania. Right. Lots of interesting things about Pennsylvania. Right. Thank you, Marsha, for those good questions. Uh, any advice for, you know, families or, you know, it, it's about that time when students may be going home for their longest break, uh, yet uh, that can pose opportunities and it can pose, you know, challenges around a lot of the things you talked about, Jonathan, relationships and communication and expectations and growth and development. Any sort of thoughts or advice or guidance for our, our families? Well, I think uh, encouragement is always valuable, um, and discouragement generally isn't. But it's a matter of figuring out what is encouraging to your student, and what's discouraging. Um, I mean, personally, I always found the question, "What are you going to do with your major?" really discouraging, um, because I really enjoyed learning about geology. Um, now I'm a mental health professional, so. Um, <laughs> You know, the skills that one learns in learning and, you know, working through a liberal arts program, um, you know, are incredible to me. So, um, you know, back to that idea of like well, finding out what what does somebody need that takes listening. Um, and I'm a professional at that now, so it comes a little bit easier. But we'll, we'll see. I have a one year old. <laughs> She'd probably differ in a couple of years. Does she listen? Never. <laughs> Um, but I think, um, you know, it's having, having a matching the response. I mean, and, and also, um, kind of being self-aware, um, you know, sometimes we're more worried than, um, you know, our student might perceive that we need to be. And sometimes, um, they're just not being communicative. So, um, it, I think it's okay to ask questions and, um, you know, find, you know, it, it, it's always what's going well, what's giving you difficulty, you know, is always a good place to start. Um, and, you know, they, I think you'll get a good read on how they respond, um, either with content or, um, or lack of it. Um, and just because somebody's not being open in what they're sharing doesn't mean there's a particular problem. It just may be a, an exercise of autonomy. Um, so, you know, I would say don't jump to conclusions either, um, you know, but yeah, be available to listen. I mean, that, I think that's universally encouraging. Any last advice, Tina? Um, don't get sick. Don't get yeah. sick. <laughs> Wash your hands. Sanitize, <laughs> sleep, try to keep those fluids up, um, just keep the immune system going. Yeah. Don't fight all this off. My guidance, is, you know, really is around don't overplan those days at home. Mm -hmm. Students may have a lot of variability in how they respond to being home, and they may need 20 hours of sleep that first mm -hmm. day rather than, you know, shopping and family and decorating the, you know, the holiday house or whatnot. And so I think, you know, kind of at least pre-communicating about what the plans are and then maybe really listening about what students want from their break, I think can be helpful in aligning aligning the stars for a positive first visit home. <laughs> all right, well, uh, we thank you all for joining us through uh, this Thriving at Junietta journey. Episode one? Yeah, something like that. Uh -huh. And Damian, I'm so appreciative of you. I mean, you've just been a, trans a wonderful, transformative sort of part of this and I couldn't have asked for a better co-host. So thank you for uh, yeah, fine. Your some some point in the show to make people blush. It's like your obligation every episode. Well, I guess I have one time. 
<laughs> and Jonathan and Tina, thanks for uh, for being here with us tonight, and thanks sure. to our uh, our our groupies, our parents, uh, for being with us as well. We've really enjoyed uh, enjoyed this opportunity. Thank you for having me. All right, all right. We'll release everyone to their bless. <laughs> Take good care. Wings up. <laughs>